All right, let's go now. We're going to go to part two in our series of living with rock solid values in an unstable age, and everything around us is shaking. And of course, we're going to zoom in on knowing what you believe and why. And you see what the Apostle Paul wrote there at the top of your outlines. He wrote to Timothy, his son in the faith. He said, now the Holy Spirit expressly says, specifically says, that in the latter times or the last days, some will depart from the faith. Yes, even the faith. By giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines that have been inspired by demons. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron. And I'm patching this together. He says, now until I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation. Here's that word again, to sound doctrine, correct? Take heed to yourself, and here it is again, to your doctrine. It's one thing to check out your own lifestyle before the Lord. That's good. It's powerful. But you better be also checking out your doctrine. And he says, now continue in these things. For in doing so, you will both save yourself and everyone who hears you or sits under you. Why? For the time will come when people will no longer want to endure sound doctrine. Look at all the rebellion, absolute, outright, foaming at the mouth, demonized rebellion that's going on even amid political circles today. Just, you know, the, the notion that a particular speaker will show up on a campus and give an, alter, an alternate point of view causes people to foam at the mouth. It's absolute insanity. We live in crazy times. We live in an unstable age. You better know what foundation your life is being built on because I think it's just the beginning of where all this is going to go. Now, people will not want to endure sound doctrine. Now, well, listen, in your minds, I want you to equate sound doctrine with absolute truth. Because that's what really sound doctrine is epitomizing or encapsulating is absolute truth. People don't want to believe that there's such a thing as absolute truth because if they bow the knee to absolute truth or they acknowledge it, that means that their opinion doesn't matter anymore. That means you can't live any way you want and escape the implications or the judgment of absolute truth. So people figure, if I won't acknowledge absolute truth and pretend like it's passed away or it doesn't exist, that means that whatever I choose to believe is my truth. Well, that's nonsense. Because truth never stops being true. (laughs) And stupidity never stops being stupidity. Now, He said the time will come when people will no longer want to even hear sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, a metaphor, they will heap up for themselves teachers, professors, so-called ministers, politicians, whatever, and will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And then last, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us, here we go again, sound doctrine. And to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. You can't tell me that's wrong. Well, the Bible does. Already does. How narrow-minded. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like a parent correcting their child. Guess what? The child thinks their parent is narrow-minded. But if the parent doesn't discipline that child, that child will grow up to be a rebellious brat that will fail in life because no one will want to be around them. Won't be able to hold a job, play on a team, play well with others. No one will want to be around them because they'll be such an obnoxious little brat. And it'll be the parent's fault for not disciplining and shaping character in them. To be respectful, to listen, to be polite, to learn how to win, to learn how to lose. See, those are absolute things. So God's word comes in, and he teaches us these things. Now, so you might ask, what is a worldview? And let's go on our outlines now. Roman numeral two. And then I'm going to get back to a little introductory comments, but let's fill in this blank. Understanding the importance of living with a worldview. And for us to grasp the importance of that, let's define it, and then I'll make some comments. 
What's in a worldview? So the worldview, by definition, means this. The beliefs that I build my life on. Notice it doesn't mean the beliefs that I suggest on. You know, it's the beliefs that I build my life on. Whatever opinions that I hold, whatever my worldview is, my values will be involved in that, and my decisions will come out of a place of values. You can say amen anytime you want because that was theoretically good. Now, now you may have never heard of this guy called Saeed Qutub. Who cares? But this guy had a profound effect on your life and my life. Imagine that, a Muslim having a profound effect on you. He had a profound effect on all of our families, our jobs, our futures, our travel. Even though he died about 40 years ago, he's had a profound influence on all of us through his worldview. Saeed Qutub. How did he do that? Because this guy was an Egyptian radical politician, radical Muslim. He read many of the same books that Hitler had read. He developed a worldview of hatred toward any non-Muslim, particularly Westerners. He hated all Jews, all Christians. He despised the Western world and all of its values. He was such a dangerous man, and his thoughts were so uh, provoking others to violence that in the 1960s, he was even put in jail by the Egyptian government with all their madness. But in prison, he continued to spread his vile worldview of hatred. Finally, the Egyptian government executed this guy. He was just so out of control. They executed him nearly 40 years ago, or over 40 years ago. And uh, that's all we would have heard of this guy had his brother not picked up his worldview and continued on in his mission. And his brother was named Muhammad Khatou. Now, this guy took his brother's worldview took it to the country of Saudi Arabia, and he began teaching it in a university there. Now, you never heard of these two brothers, maybe, but you've heard of their number one star pupil, Osama bin Laden. It's bin Laden who picked up the mantle of this guy's worldview and said, this is what we're going to do. And... His mentor, the guy who got executed, became the intellectual, served as the intellectual underpinning for all of bin Laden's worldview. When you say that bin Laden built his life on his worldview, you better believe it. And his decisions came out of that worldview. So a worldview is critical because it will be the foundation upon which we build our lives and all of our beliefs and decisions and values come out of that place. So it's no small thing. Right. One guy's worldview rocked the world on 9-11 through the legacy of hatred. Listen, this clown that got executed way back when his worldview still affects you and I because the next time you go into an airport, they make you take your shoes off. You got to go through all kinds of hoops and security things, all, all because one guy's worldview came to full fruition. That's one guy changed the whole world of travel, changed the entire idea of security. I remember back in the 70s, took my first flight ever, flew from here to California. Back then, if you got a ticket and you didn't want to use it anymore, you just gave it to a stranger if you wanted to. I remember swapping tickets all the time. You didn't go through anything. I don't know what you went through, but it was ridiculous because there was never a problem. I don't even know that they asked for a photo ID. I think I just bought a ticket and walked away from the counter. Nothing, not, there was nothing. One man changed the world and continued, and we feel the ripple and live within the ripples of one guy's worldview. 
That's how important this topic is, guys. You know why? Because ideas have consequences. Every idea has a consequence, good or bad, because every idea sooner or later leads to an action. Even the most trivial of ideas has a consequence because in it, we might be wasting time, money, or energy. Someone, through an idea, could be wasting their life on something trivial and meaningless instead of something that has meaning and substance to it. So we may not realize it at a conscious level all the time, but we are always being influenced by the worldviews of other people, the people all around us. I want you to think about what happens to an co average college student in the secular universities of America. They walk in thinking one thing. By the time they graduate, they're absolutely indoctrinated into communist, socialist, fascist, or some other weird ideas, all coming through liberal, radical professors who claim that they just teach material, you know, objectively, but that's nonsense. You look at all the revisionist history alone. Now, you take a history course. America is the most evil empire that's ever existed. Everything we built on is a lie. Everything we've done is wrong. We're wicked. We're bad. We're just, you know, this, we're that, and the other thing. And yet these same people trashing us be the same people taking the money from America after a tragedy happens in their country. So let's take a look at this. When we talk about worldview, it's important because it's how I view God, how I view the world, how I view others around me, how I view Satan, how I view time, how I view eternity, how I view the afterlife. Everything in our worldview has to do with how I view pain and suffering. You see, if my worldview is no good God would ever allow pain and suffering, then it immediately brings me to a place where either I dismiss God or I hate him. The question is, when you back up, what is your worldview based upon? If it's based upon conjecture or someone else's baseless opinion, then you have been affected by someone else's worldview. So their baselessness has now become your mission, and it has warped you. That's why parenting a child is so crucial, and it's such a heavy-duty obligation and it will bring judgment from God when not done properly. Because you have the, a child is just a pliable, little, innocent person. And when a parent warps them with a bad worldview, beginning with how are they raising them up concerning the things of the Lord. All right? Now, how many of you know, very simply, I'm going to move on quickly. That if you, you see something on the side of the road, let's say something laying on the side of the road, and it's across the road, you pull your car over on this side, and you want to go pick that up, that you wait for other cars to pass by, you make sure it's safe, then you go get that thing. Now, how many of you know that just a simple little decision like that, you might say that's common sense. But listen, it is. But common sense is based upon a worldview. The worldview is I need to respect the fact that other people take priority on the road, especially when their 2,000-pound car weighs a little bit more than me. You understand that even that is based upon a worldview. The, the weighting is based upon an idea. All right, so let's go. When we talk about the worldview, there are several different worldviews that are swirling around us all the time, every day. I'm going to go through them very quickly. But I want you to know something this morning, that whatever you grow up with in your life, whatever values, priorities, whatever things were imparted to you, whatever things you picked up along the way, theologically or otherwise, most people have a mixed hybrid of a theological bag. There are a little this, there are a little that, there are a little this, there are a little that, a little this, and they put into this huge stew, well, I don't know, I guess just believing that God exists is enough. 
because all this other stuff is too confusing for me. So whatever it is that you grew up with, here's the beautiful part, and yet challenging part at the same time, that when you really come to know Jesus, and you come to know the scriptures, you are still going to have those worldviews, but now his truth is going to confront some of those. Now, our responsibility to that is to believe that his word is true and that his truth will outlast my ideas. Amen. And that I have to yield these, my baseless ideas that are really based on very little of anything, and I've got to yield those to his infinite truth. You know what that's called? Being transformed by the renewing of your mind. The entrance of his word gives us light. The entrance of his word gives us light. And it gives understanding to the spiritually naive or uninitiated. So it's very, very important. Because the devil, who doesn't want you to grow in the Lord, is going to keep having you play these, uh, these tapes or CDs back in your mind, when the Lord is saying, this is what my word says, and the Holy Spirit is saying this, he's going to keep on playing yesterday's stuff. So the biggest battle in growing in Christ will not be in your spirit. Once you're in Christ, that's settled. It will be in between your ears. Because in between your ears is where worldviews reside. Here we go. Now, let's look at some common worldviews. Ready? Number one. The one that says, the one with the most toys wins. You see the bumper stickers? It's called materialism. The real fact of the matter is, the one with the most toys still dies. The one who dies with the most toys still dies. And he can't take a single toy with him when he goes. And in fact, most people buy toys they can't even afford to begin with. So it's really the bank's toy. The bank's toy and your bill. You see, materialism really says this, that what matters most in life are my acquisitions. The things I can accumulate, the degrees, the diplomas, the this, the that, the money. Everything is based upon materialism. Now, Jesus always came against the conventional wisdom of the day. And so when it came to materialism... Jesus had to say this on your notes there, Luke 12, 15. A person's life does not consist in the abundance of their possessions. That means at the end of the day, having things or not having things doesn't make you a better or worse person. Because you have things doesn't make you smart and it doesn't make you successful and it doesn't do anything for you in reference to eternity and where you're going. Now, there's nothing wrong with having things, but materialism is a worldview that loves things instead of loves God. And it's very destructive. You ever check out a People magazine? Well, you know, take some Pepto-Bismol before you do, I guess, but <laughs> the vanity, the absolute vanity. One singer who, I don't even remember her name and I couldn't care less, but one modern singer said, they got interviewed, said, I'm a gajillionaire. <laughs> wow. But I mean, such vanity. Right. And we've got to be real careful of that. Because it destroys people's lives. Number two, the second worldview that's around us all the time is called individualism. Individualism means I've got to think of me first. And I'll tell you what, that's a very destructive thing when you have parents thinking of themselves first instead of their children in their best interest. And yet you have all kinds of young people having children, but they're thinking this way. <laughs> you ever notice sometimes a young girl has a baby and the baby's 15 feet, 20 feet behind her in a, in a busy mall. Talking about a toddler. 
while the girl's too busy looking in the store windows and shops. And she yells, screams back, come on, keep up, come on. It's terrible. That kid is going to grow up with such insecurity, such a spirit of rejection. Uh, I mean, it's just going to be amazing that the issues, tragically, that kid's going to have. But look at what Jesus said. He said, if you try and keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, he doesn't mean physically give up your life. But if you kind of give your life agenda to me, you will find true life. The true meaning of life is not in putting yourself first. Because when you make yourself the center of the universe, it's a real small orbit. Let's go to number three, the third, third worldview. I'm telling you that people live out these worldviews without even knowing the definition of these things. They just, these things grab them. Number three is this, called hedonism. And that means I do whatever feels good. Remember in the 60s, the hippies started all that? Whatever feels good, do it. Well, we're reaping the whirlwind of that idiocy one generation later now. But in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 4, it's not on your notes. You can just jot that reference down. 2 Timothy 3 in verse 4, Paul said there'll come a time when people will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Disobedient to parents, etc., etc., unthankful, unholy, rebellious. Amen. We're in that day. Amen. But hedonism really means you are a lover of pleasure. And if there's any country that does that, it's America. Because we have so much money, we can amuse ourselves to death. We can buy pretty much anything we want in this country. Any store you want to go to has typically what you want to buy if you have the money. And we are the most distracted a country or generation that I've seen in my lifetime. Because we have so much access to so much. And you see the scripture, Proverbs 21, 17, says, are you addicted to thrills? What an empty life, Solomon said, because the pursuit of pleasure is a pit that you'll never find the bottom of. It will take you down a road that will waste all your time, money, and years and never satisfy the soul. Amen. See, hedonism revolves around this idea that the most important thing in life is how I feel. If I don't feel it, I don't do it. If I feel it, I do it. I, how I feel, now you see why in this generation, everything is touchy-feely. Right. Everyone needs therapy. You say this, and I'm offended. Amen. And you have to see a grown man apologizing like a wimp and a weasel in front of the world on CNN because he misspoke one word. Oh, it's a politically incorrect. Oh. <laughs> and he's groveling like a fool because a bunch of people start whining about the fact that he misspoke a word. It's crazy. Next, the next worldview, and by the way, you know what uh, Hugh Hefner, before he died, the founder of Playboy, the Playboy Mansion, all that stuff, guess what he said? I am a true hedonist. Well, he, uh, he's found out a different truth right now. Here we go. Ready? The next one is uh, called pragmatism. That means whatever works for you. Pragmatism. It's like if you go and you tell someone, well, I'm a Christian and I go to church. And, uh, well, hey, hey, whatever works for you. You know, what works for me is I worship my shoe. What works for me is... Uh, I pray to my dead grand grandmother. You know, what works for you? As though all of these things are just alternate views of reality. And that none of them have any more substance or merit than the next idea. Pragmatism just goes for the practical, whatever, whatever turns you on. Remember Sly Stone, if you remember Sly and a Family Stone, 
different strokes for different folks. But guess what? God has some universal laws. God has universal laws. But somebody says, oh, I don't believe in those. Listen, if you don't believe in them, it doesn't mean you're still not breaking them. It's like the law of gravity. I don't believe in that. Well, then step out of a fourth floor, you know, fourth floor window. You can disagree with it all the way until you hit the ground. Then your doctor will explain to you why you should have believed in it. Now think about that. Then they'll send you for therapy for being a fool for not having believed in it. You say, well, you know what? In my world, I choose to believe what I want. Well, if you do it again, we're going to put you in a facility. So why would it be then that dramatic for somebody to think that way, both from a medical standpoint and from the person walking out the window? Because it was a faulty worldview. Next. The next worldview that swirls around us is naturalism or atheism. These are somewhat interchangeable terms, naturalism or atheism. And this really says that God doesn't really exist, or if he does, he doesn't really matter. And a lot of people have this worldview, although they will not articulate this, they're governed, their decisions are governed by this worldview. You don't realize that most atheists don't even want to admit that they're atheists. Most atheists don't want to admit that they're atheists. Most. You know, this kind of worldview just believes that whatever's happened, happened as a result of random chance. We're all accidents of nature. There's no grand creator. There's no grand design. There's no God. God doesn't exist. And if he does, he's pretty much irrelevant. Listen, let you in on a little secret. If he doesn't exist and he doesn't matter, that means that you don't matter. Now, why is it that everyone thinks they matter, but they're telling God he doesn't matter? You understand that what starts with the top runs down to the feet. If you really believe he doesn't matter, that only means that you don't matter. Because if you're an accident freak of nature, why should you matter? You have no intrinsic value. That means you came from nothing. You're going to go back to nothing. There is no one to hold you accountable to anything higher. If you came from two rocks banging together, then what are you? You don't have value. Now, if you don't have value, that means we all don't have any value. Then what does it all matter? That means fundamentally then, life has no meaning aside from these few years we have on this planet. And whenever there's no meaning that goes beyond this existence, there'll be no moral law keeping things in order. But there's a reason why every culture on the planet that anthropologists and missionaries have gone to, everyone is worshiping in some fashion. Every culture has worshiped in some fashion, however misguided. A guy named Bertrand Russell, a philosopher, he was an atheist. And here's what he said. He said, if you remove the question of God, this guy was a stone-cold atheist. If you remove the question of God, he said, then the question of the purpose of life becomes irrelevant. Amen. Good word. So what he's saying, if there's no purpose, if there's no life in God, no design, it's all just an accident, then, it's, then nothing else matters either. Isn't that crazy? Talking about being painted into a corner. But you see the scripture under this point said, from the beginning of creation... God has shown what he's really like by all that he has made. When someone says, well, I don't know if I believe in God, just look at creation itself, the Bible says. That's, that's just looking at his handiwork. He has left his handiwork as a non-speaking, non-verbal sign of his presence and his glory and his articulate nature. Because if we were one degree this way on the earth axis, we would freeze. One degree that way, we burn up. 
all the planets, all gravity, everything in perfect order. How's that? Because a big dust storm came by? One guy put it this way, that the odds of the Bible not being true in reference to these things, these things I'm talking about, would be the equivalent of completely dismantling a 747 jet, putting it in the middle of the desert with every piece lying on the desert floor, a sandstorm, a windstorm comes through, a tornado in effect, and it assembles the jet. Those would be the odds. Now, if you want to believe in that folly, that somehow that has happened, that a sandstorm has gotten the job done, knock yourself out. It's just a road to nowhere. But look at this, what the scripture says. God has shown who he really is by what he has made, creation itself. That's why those people who don't believe in him have no excuse. They know about God, but they don't honor him or thank him or worship him for who he really is. They claim to be wise, but they're really fools. Look at the next, next worldview is you are your own God, and that's called humanism. Now, in this view, they believe in God, but God happens to be them. They just believe that we're all little fragments of what we know to be God. So why worship him when we're all little pieces of him? Now, guess what that lie is based upon? Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve got suckered in by Satan, by the serpent. Guess what he told them? Eat of the fruit of this tree and you'll become like God's. So this demonic worldview takes its place all the way back in the Garden of Eden from the devil himself. But see, there's something in fallen human nature that wants to believe that they are God so that it frees them up from being accountable to the living God. Because if I get away from accountability, there's no guilt. It removes guilt and it removes the fear of judgment. So then it no longer is a restrainer of my lifestyle. Are you with me? So, I want you to write this scripture down too. Genesis chapter 11. You can read it for yourself in Genesis chapter 11. Remember, all the people in the earth at that point said, we're going to build a tower that will reach heaven. That was called the Tower of Babel. So guess what the whole idea was? We're going to go up, and we're going to be like God. We don't need him. We're going to be, by you know, human ingenuity, we're going to build a tower that can reach heaven. So the Lord came down. He said, I've had it. Basically, he brought judgment down on all of them. And guess what he did? He broke their unity, their soulish, demonic unity, by confusing their languages. So if you want to know where all the various languages of the earth came from, It's when the Lord scattered them by confusing their languages. They all spoke one language at that point. And then when the Lord came down, all of a sudden, now if there was 100,000 people, you had 10 groups of 10,000 all speaking different languages. So they could no longer come into a place of unity. So the ones who spoke the same language, they had a tendency to kind of go with the people they could understand. And that's how the earth was populated country by country as we know it. Well, you see, the population of the earth, instead of moving out from a place of blessing, namely, if Adam and Eve had obeyed the Lord, it came out of a place of judgment. Humanism. It's when they exchange the truth of God for a lie. What's the lie? I can do what I want because I'm a little God. By the way, if you ever get your hands on something called a humanist manifesto, or maybe... If you've heard of the Humanist Manifesto with humanism, and I just have a little little fragment of it. Look at what their creed consists of. Said religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not having been created. Humanism believes that man is a part of nature and that he has emerged as a result of a continuous process of evolution. Third, holding an organic view of life, humanists find the traditional dualism of mind and body must be rejected. In other words, we have no soul. 
were just a higher version of your dog. <clears throat> Humanism recognizes that man's religious culture and civilization, as clearly depicted by anthropology and history, are the product of a gradual development due to his interaction with his natural environment and with his social heritage. That an individual born into a culture is largely molded by that culture. So what he's saying there is, is that over the course of years, as cultures have developed, religions have developed, but now we've outgrown the need for any of that nonsense. We're enlightened. Humanism asserts that the nature of the universe, as defined now by science, makes unacceptable any supernatural guarantees of human values. In other words, it was never created by God. Two rocks banged together, two planets smashed into each other, and that was it. And last, I won't bore you with this stuff. We are convinced that the time has passed for theism, deism, modernism, and all other kinds of variety of new thought. Man now has become the measure. Wow. There's humanism. That man is the measure, not God. We need to measure up to him. No, man is the measure. And last, here's the real, the good view. God made me for his purposes, and it's called theism. We've been made by God. We've been made for his purposes. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what we believe. For everything, Colossians 1.16 on your notes, Absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him and only finds its purpose in him. That's why so many people with tons of money live purposeless, empty lives despite all the resources this life has to offer. Fame, fortune, power, empty. All right, so let's, let's run through this last little piece. Why does it matter what I believe? What's the big deal? Number one, you have to realize that your life will be shaped by your thoughts. So that's crucial. By the way, I just want to insert this real quickly into this mix. There are two common myths that people wrestle with, and one of which is called a sincerity myth. It doesn't matter what you believe this means as long as you're sincere about it. Well, it couldn't be farther from the truth. It takes more than sincerity to make it in life. Sincerity is not enough. You know, I was reading recently about a plane that the pilot flew the plane into the side of a mountain. Totally by accident. You understand that. You know why? because he believed that his altitude would carry him above the mountain. But guess what? He was sincerely wrong. So you see, what we believe has to be based upon a higher truth, a higher reality than what we think. Now, the other is the situational myth. So the other view here, the other myth is it doesn't matter what I believe, that what I believe is based upon each circumstance. It's called moral relativism. What I would do in one instance doesn't mean I would do the same thing in the other. That my values have a shifting and changing nature to them. How many of you the truth always remains true? Okay, so let's get back to this now. Why does it matter what I believe? Number one, our life is shaped by our thoughts. Number two, the, the two things that we want to to uh, recognize with this. Is that we need to know what God is doing. And he wants us to know what he's doing. You see, if, it says, it says uh, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. So what we have in life, is what we have is enough to what he's revealed to do his will to come to him, to believe that he is. And then third, it matters what I believe because I'm, if I'm a Christian, I'm to give a logical defense of my faith concerning the hope that lies within me to people who don't know Christ. 
If I don't know what I believe as a Christian, does it really matter when it comes time to share with someone who's not a Christian? And they want to know, hey, why is there such a hope within you? I don't know. I just sort of like the church I go to. Well, what is that? That's ridiculous. So it's imperative that we come to know God's truth, develop our worldview out of a place of his truth, because then we can give a logical defense. doesn't mean you're going to be an apologetics expert, but you've got to give a logical defense concerning the hope that's within you in Christ. Okay, now last. How can I strengthen my worldview? Four things. Number one, learn what is true. That's what we're doing here this morning. You say, why am I just aren't, you know, why don't I just get up here shouting and spitting? Because that's not what we're here for. We got to be equipping. It's, we got to be in an equipping mode. Because too many Christians, their doctrine is pathetic. They couldn't explain to a five-year-old six things. They may not know eight, ten scriptures that they could quote verbatim. If I asked them, quote me ten scriptures right now, they'd look at me like I had three heads. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Get into your word. Know your word. Get your word in you. Pray that the Lord would open your ears so you could hear him, that the Holy Spirit can use you and he can guide you and lead you. Get your head out of your phones. Get your face out of your devices. Turn them off. Get off Instagram. Get off this stuff, Facebook. Float it down the river. <laughs> Except for a certain segment of time, you give yourself, you do your thing, and then turn the thing off. Amen. Americans are checking their phones 120 times a day now. 120 times a day. <laughs> Listen, with that, I don't know you have time to live a life. Now, obviously, for business, it's going to be a game changer there. But learn what is true. Next, discern what is false. And you're going to find a whole lot of falsehood around you as you live each day. People with half-baked worldviews and half-baked ideas. Mixed bag. Listen, I remember talking to a Catholic one day. I was sharing with him in the gym, and he said, and I, he, he made some kind of ridiculous point, and I said, do you realize that what you're telling me, and you're calling yourself a staunch Catholic, and what you're saying, you've just disagreed with three-quarters of your own catechism. And by the way, your own pope says that's not right. Well, I don't believe him. <laughs> oh, you mean God's representative on earth? You're dismissing him out of hand. But you want to call yourself a good Catholic as long as you don't have to believe anything in it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Said if you're going to be wrong, at least be sincere about it. <laughs> at least tell me that you believe something and give me the reasons why. Don't say, I don't like that guy. I don't believe in him. He's supposed to be God's representative on earth. He is God's voice to you as a Catholic, to you by your own documents he is God's living voice when it comes to doctrine and church affairs of Catholicism. And you're telling God you don't care about his representative. What are you? What are you, man? You're a Catholic humanist. You're God. But you don't want to admit it. You know, you know what that's called in theological terms? Practical atheism. I would never say I'm an atheist, but I live as though I am. God fits into my values when they agree with what I think. As long as he doesn't crash my party, cramp my style, or tell me what to do, I love him. What a good God. He's my cosmic sugar daddy. <laughs> I pray when I need things. I pray when I get in a big jam. And once he gets me out of it, I say, thanks, I'll take it from here. Now, where was I? Let me go to the club. You don't realize that every time you call upon the name of the Lord, he intervenes, you are accountable in judgment for yet another intervention of his hand. 
You've just made things worse for yourself, not better. Learn what is true. Discern what is false. I can't discern what's false. Now, you know this, but our U.S. Treasury agents spend thousands of hours looking at real U.S. currency. When they see the counterfeit, that's how they discern the counterfeit, because they know the real. They don't study the false to know the truth. They study the true to expose the false. You don't study the truth, you're going to never know what's false that maybe even you're buying into today. And God wants you to know what's true. His word is his revealed truth to us and for us. To know who he is. Because I grew up in a religious setting. When I came to Jesus, it blew my mind all the things I didn't know that I thought I knew. I was convinced I knew, in fact. And when I started reading this, it blew away half the things that I believed. Because I was only taught in a religious setting, but never read the owner's manual. And anytime I don't know the purpose for something, abuse is inevitable. If I don't know the purpose for my life, I'll just abuse that purpose. If I don't know the purpose for a marriage, I'll abuse that marriage. If I don't know the purpose for a toaster, I'll get cold and bring it in, a, in the bathtub with me. <laughs> Doesn't mean I'm stupid. I just don't know the purpose for that. So if you don't know the purpose for time and for life, you will abuse it by wasting it or misusing it. Learn the truth, discern the false. Third, turn from the world to the word. Turn from the world. This world has nothing. The Bible says this world and all that's in it is passing away as we speak. And last, Concern yourself with God's agenda. You see the scripture right under that point? God will give you all that you need, direction, purpose, meaning, uh, provision. He'll give you all that you need from day to day if you make the kingdom of God your primary concern. He makes us some wonderful promises in his word. Let's go after him with all of our hearts. Should we do that? Come on, let's stand together. Thank you so much for joining us today. If God has impacted your life through this message, please join Victory in reaching people all around the world by sowing back into the kingdom today. You can give at rvictory.org slash give or download the Victory Church app and select give. Find Victory on social media for bonus teachings and content all throughout the week. 